Welcome everybody to securing a brighter future without line five or an oil tunnel, a community conversation for residents of Mackinac Island, the Straits area and beyond. I'm Liz Kirkwood. I'm the executive director of Flow for Love of Water. We're a Great Lakes Water Law and Policy Center based here in Traverse City. I will be your moderator today. I'd like to extend a warm, warm welcome to our esteemed panelists today. I am pleased to be joined by Dr. Edward Tim, PhD, PE, retired as a senior scientist of Dow Chemical Company. Then we have Stanley Skip, as he's better known, Press, who's former director of Michigan Department of Energy, Labor, and Economic Growth, and chief energy officer for Michigan. And then we have Ian Bunn, Senior Advisor for Plymouth Growth Partners, and followed by uh, Brian Newlin, our Chairman of the Bay Mills Indian Community. This is the, the sixth summer uh, that Flo has hosted an educational community conversation on Mackinac Island. And while we miss seeing you in person, we are delighted to be hosting this free webinar this year supported with a grant award from the Mackinac Island Community Foundation's Natural Resources and Preservation Fund. The benefits of doing this virtually, however, is that we're able to expand our reach and connect with interested audience members across Michigan and, and all over the country. In our uh, first, I'd like to just uh, touch upon a couple of housekeeping items. We are video recording this 90 minute session and we will follow up with an email uh, with links to the recording and other related materials. In our first hour together, we will hear from our four panelists to share the scientific, legal, tribal, and financial risk factors to compel the permanent decommissioning of the 67 year old line five pipelines exposed in the open waters of the Great Lakes and to discuss the barriers to Enbridge's proposed tunnel. This proposal must be understood not in the context of 1959 when Line 5 was originally designed and built, but in 2020 and the larger context of the declining global oil demand markets, stranded pipeline assets, climate change impacts, and feasible and prudent energy alternatives for Michigan and the Great Lakes region. In the final half hour, we will answer many of your questions uh, as we can hold that are submitted to you using the Q&A button found near the bottom center of your screen. You can use it to submit your queries at any time during the webinar. And we also will be taking questions via Flo's Facebook live feed. Finally, we'll be using the chat box to share links with key resources with you throughout the session. This timely session comes at a time when half of Line 5 is shut down by a court order due to the significant damage to the pipeline infrastructure exposed on the lake bed floor. Line 5 remains a clear and present danger to our public waters in the heart of the Great Lakes. And a 99-year oil tunnel and pipeline would hasten a climate catastrophe that is the biggest existential threat to 20% of the world's fresh surface water. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first panelist, Dr. Ed Tim. He's a licensed professional engineer uh, in chemical engineering from the University of Michigan. He's a retired senior scientist from Dow Chemical Company holds 26 chemical processing patents and has hands-on experience with petro petrochemical and refinery processes. Dr. Tim spent his last year, last four years at Dow Chemical and Environmental Operations and Cleanup. In, in 2014, he became interested in the Line 5 controversy. Since then, he's published work on the Monte Carlo simulation of pipeline external corrosion and an extensive analysis on the effects of currents and bioaccumulation of the structural stability of the Line 5 Straits Crossing. His research on Line 5 has determined that this pipeline is riskier than we are 
be led to believe by Enbridge. In this talk, he will discuss the safety of Line 5 and other pipelines from an experienced engineer's perspective. Ed, I'm going to turn things over to you. All right, Liz, uh, thank you very much and thank the audience for uh, this webinar and attending it. Uh, I want to uh, take a, I'm going to try and move right along here, but the point of my talk here is that our technical revolution, technical industrial revolution has led to many, many wonders that we couldn't live without, one of them being Zoom. And uh, it has also done one other thing. It has given us the ability to have greater and much more consequential wrecks. And as a scientist, engineer, I have always been interested in failures. You have to be. I have my share in my own quiver. But I developed an interest in a field that's called forensic structural engineering. This is the autopsy process after a big disaster has occurred in the engineering analysis of why it happened. This is a field that was brought to prominence by a professor, Henry Petrowski, uh, who has written several books on the subject that I recommend highly. Um, but one of the teachings, if you read a lot of his work, is that there are almost no accidents. The fact of the matter is, is this quotation at the bottom of this slide from Cicero a um, very long time ago, is that there are always warning signs. And today I'm going to take a look at line five in the straits through the lens of a forensic structural engineer and go through a few examples. So if I could have the next slide, please. Here's a fine old example of, of a technological disaster, something that could only happen in our age. The Challenger disaster, almost everybody was affected by it that is older than a uh, uh, certain age. And it, it was a very big shock to the engineering community, especially after the uh, autopsy of this uh, incident was done. Next slide, please. And the learning process resulted in some very hard conclusions. There was a commission put together called the Rogers Commission, and it just found that NASA's organizational and decision-making culture had slipped mightily from the original days. The NASA managers had known that the solid rocket boosters for the space shuttle could have a problem under certain conditions. That certain condition was as if it was cold enough that the O-rings that sealed up the boosters were cold. And they knew very well what that temperature was based on temperature uh, testing. And of course, what happened is NASA managers ignored the technical information about that. They ignored the engineers that tried to tell them there was a problem and they launched the rocket anyway it performed exactly as it should have. It said in the instructions, if you launch this at this temperature, it will blow up and it did. The lesson of this experience is you should never ignore original design information without a thorough reanalysis of the situation. Next slide, please. A much more recent set of failures, the Boeing 737 MAX. Uh, if you would step into the next slide, please. This, this, no, we've missed, there we go. The MAX was originally designed in 64, and to keep up with the times, it was stretched twice, re-engined, modified, and, and all the while keeping the original pulley and cable flight control system. So to fix that, the engineers added a computer-controlled stability system. Uh, 2019, two 737s crashed. Investigations showed that the stability enhancement system could take over the plane and crash it. During those investigations, there were all kinds of communications understood, uncovered, where experienced engineers warned the system was problematic. What's the lesson here? That when you remediate a problem that does, emerges due to a change from an original design, you always have to analyze that change for the introduction of a new failure mode. Next slide, please. Here's another little disaster that's very close to home, the Edenville, Michigan Dam. This happened very recently, 
The cost estimated at this point to replace things as they were is $340 million. Next slide, please. Uh, so what happened here? Well, it was constructed in 1924 for a circus owner who wanted to be a real estate developer. 2006, engineers said the spillways aren't big enough. This thing will overtop in a probable flood. 2018, the feds revoked the license to generate power and turned the dam over to the state. The state inspectors looked at the thing and found exactly what the feds did, but the state took no action. And in 2020, the dam failed during a torrential rainstorm and it caused a lot of damage. The lesson you can take from this is that when inspectors repeatedly find structural problems, you need to do something about it. Next slide, please. So that brings us to the uh, current subject of this talk. And that has to do with line five under the straits. And line five, which was built in 1953, uh, was a problem from the beginning. Big construction problem projects always have problems and line five was no different. The intention was to dredge a beautifully built road almost underneath the straits and lay the pipe on that road and there would be no future problems and no localized stress because the pipe was supported everywhere. Well, that never happened. Eat from the beginning, there were spans where they didn't get the dredging right. And so they came up with a fix. They piled clay on the pipe from here and, here and there. But there was an original problem. And in 1954, Bechtel engineers noted that the currents in the straits were higher than they thought they were, and that they might have to do something about it. And they recommended that in 1954, that concrete saddles be able be placed over the pipe to prevent uh, erosion on the pipe. Obviously, that never happened. Uh, strong currents undermined the pipe. Uh, the, the pipe uh, grew, very, grew some very long spans. Enbridge's initial attempts to fix the pipe by putting sandbags under it were a complete failure. And uh, in, in 2001, Enbridge engineers wrote in a field report that to maintain the pipeline integrity, they needed to make repairs. This is after they were warned in 1954 that they needed to make repairs. Enbridge waited until 2003, and there are places, if you look, where the pipe has probably collapsed and it wasn't fixed in time. Uh, Enbridge is continuing on this program to add anchors to the pipe to support it because the original design has failed. This remediated structure is not compliant with the engineering guidelines for pipes that have been undermined, written by DNV. And Obviously, some failure modes have been introduced in this pipe that weren't really a problem before. There have been anchor strikes, and most recently, uh, there is a support that's been bent and twisted that's been in the news, but ultimately, there's some other bent supports that I find found by going through the inspection videos that haven't been explained. So clearly, there are things going on based on inspection that weren't part of the original design and aren't failure modes that could have happened with the original design. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide is just a rehash of the points I made to you in case you want to go back over this or want to talk about it. But my slide here is where I asked the question based on forensic structural engineering. Is this line being operated in accordance with good engineering practice? So let's look at some of the lessons we just picked up. You should never ignore original design information without a thorough reanalysis. There is no documentation anywhere that Enbridge has done a comprehensive reanalysis of the structure as supported with 200 pipe supports in a channel that has currents much stronger. Um, when remediating a problem, you have to look for new failure modes. There is no documentation whatsoever that Enbridge has considered what new failure modes, primarily failure modes having to do 
with what's called foreign object damage, anchors, cables, whatnot, and also vibration, which can happen in supported structures. Another lesson, that's when inspectors repeatedly find structural problems, you must take action. Well, Enbridge waited from 1954 until nearly 2003 to really start doing anything, and it's totally unclear if what they've done is effective. So what that leads me to is a hard and fast engineering opinion. And in answer to the first question on this page, I believe that line five should be decommissioned until a comprehensive engineering investigation by a proven unbiased engineering firm determines why line five failures keep happening. If this proves possible to make line five safe, as an engineer, I, I can't say that that's problematic, but then and only then, the remediated design would have to be repermitted under the Great Lakes Submerged Lands Act and other governing legislation. So really, where I end up on this very short presentation that I would be happy to stretch out much longer in a proper lecture, is that this thing is a wreck waiting to happen. It's totally consistent. When, when it happens and people look at what happens, they'll, they'll slap their heads and say, of course, you ask for this. And consequently, the thing should be decommissioned and thoroughly reanalyzed and thoroughly repermitted. And so at that point, I'd like to turn my time over to the next speaker. And I hope I've made my point and am we willing to answer questions that nine, line five is a disaster waiting to happen, not for funky reasons, flaky reasons, but for very solid engineering reasons based on the learnings of 200 years of engineering disasters. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Ed. Thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. I would like to now uh, briefly uh, introduce Skip Press, um, who's an attorney and energy expert with decades upon decades of experience in both the private and public sector. He's served as former cabinet member and director of the Michigan Department of Energy, Labor, and Economic Growth, as well as the former chief energy officer for the state of Michigan under Governor Jennifer Granhall, where he was responsible for designing and implementing Michigan's clean energy economy diversification efforts. Earlier in his career, Skip served as deputy director of the Michigan Department of, Ener of Environmental Quality and the assistant attorney general in charge of Michigan's consumer protection division. Skip also is co-founder of Five Lakes Energy LLC, a clean energy technology consultancy focusing on enabling and accelerating Michigan's clean energy economy. Skip, welcome, and I'm turning things over to you. Thank you, Liz, and uh, thank you for the opportunity. This is so very important to, um, to uh, provide people with information so we can all be on the same page. Uh, the first thing I want to do is, uh, in a summary fashion, is sort of uh, underscore and emphasize what Dr. Tim, uh, uh, the point that he had just made by going over what we know about the risk factors. There are, there's evidence of multiple risk factors that really indicate how vulnerable this pipeline is. And I just want to go through them briefly. So one of them, of course, are potential anchor imp impacts. We know of several events. Um, in June 1979, uh, transmission cables operated by Consumers Power Company were cut by an anchor strike. In April 2018, of course, we, we had those events that were uh, in the news uh, uh, and quite prominent. And then most recently, there was evidence of impacts to both of the pipelines, the Eastern and Western pipeline that may have occurred in May 2020. In July, on July 22nd, Enbridge released its forensic report or its report on what may have caused those most recent events. And that report indicated that it could have been yet another anchor strike, but it, it wasn't certain. 
or it could have been a mooring cable that was, or a chain that was dragged. Um, but it, they also indicated in the report that there may have been a fourth anchor event or likely there likely was another anchor event of some kind uh, because they found an anchor laying proximate to the pipelines, but Enbridge indicates in the report that it, it was not responsible for any of the Im recent impacts. Uh, there's no explanation as to why they came to that conclusion, but that is their conclusion. In addition to that, we have the possibility of catenary events. And in fact, that, that is a possi possible explanation for the last impacts um, to the pipelines. And a catenary event is when a tug is pulling a barge with a lengthy, lengthy cable. That cable sags because of its weight. And if the barge either alters course or slows down, that sag will increase and it could drag across the bottom. Uh, we, we don't know exactly how much tug and barge traffic there is in the Straits, but it may be considerable. There are, there are um, based upon information, 15 large tugs that operate in the Straits, and we know that the Straits is a place of high vessel density. Uh, third, again, and I mentioned this, the Embridge report indicates that the damages could be caused by a cable or, or chain drag. Most interesting is that Embridge, based upon vessel tracking uh, and the database that exists that tracks all commercial vessels in real time, Embridge narrowed down the impacts um, to the possibility of 13 vessels that had passed, five of which were under contract to Embridge, and four of which Embridge concluded could possibly account for the most re recent impacts to both pipelines. Uh, and so this is significant because three of those vessels were doing geophysical geophysic work, presumably in preparation for work on the tunnel. And the fourth was a tug pulling a barge um, that was doing work for, for Embridge. And so the operation and maintenance of this now elevated pipeline crossing the Straits and or the geophysical work entailed in preparing for the construction of the tunnel are themselves risk factors that have already most likely impacted the, the pipeline and caused, you know, it, uh, uh, had a strike um, to both an anchor support and both pipelines and and uh, should be of concern. So uh, Dr. Tim talked a lot about the lack of um, design, uh, new design analysis for the now elevated pipeline. Back in 1954, when the pipeline was being proposed, there were rigorous design, design analysis in 19 specific areas. Um, 19 specific engineering analysis looked at things like vertical stress, lateral stress, uh, pressure differentials, other things that Ed would understand and I do not understand. But the point is, there was a thorough engineering analysis that was reviewed and signed off by consulting engineers for a pipeline that was intended to lay on the bed of Lake uh, of the Straits. Now we have a pipeline, half of which is now elevated. And we, so we have a design that's much more complex much more vulnerable, in, in the words of Ed Tim, is subject to many more um, uh, failure modes, uh, given the fact that it's elevated and certainly seems more susceptible to anchor strikes, catenary events, and cable or chain drags. Uh, another risk factor is the fact that Enbridge has been negligent in observing safety procedures and has, I don't say that lightly, but they have been fined uh, recently $6.7 million for neglecting pipeline safe, safety issues. Uh, they have had numerous releases from the pipeline system and at least 29, maybe the, the account now is 33 leaks and spills from line five since its 
installation, at least those that we know of. I addressed uh, number six, the no publicly disclosed risk analysis. Uh, number seven, I'm going to go into more detail, but we have a lack of financial assurances uh, uh, in the event of a pipeline failure. And lastly, uh, we have the reality in this in the straits, this area of high vessel density, that if a vessel were to lose power, it would likely take measures to save the vessel, which would m possibly mean casting an anchor. Uh, we very recently on July 5th, the American, or excuse me, the Atlantic Huron, a 736 foot Canadian vessel, lost power in the Sioux locks and hit the, po uh, the Polak. It, uh, it dropped an anchor to try and stop its, its momentum. Next slide, please. Uh, moving on to the uh, litigation efforts that are, have been undertaken thus far. Um, the Environmental Law and Policy Institute, together with the National Fi uh, Wildlife Federation, filed suit in 2018 in order to uh, compel Enbridge, to have the courts compel Enbridge to develop an adequate oil spill response plan. Uh, it seems pretty clear from the record uh, and, through, and from some Coast Guard admissions that during periods of high wavelength or wave height, uh, during storm events or high winds when the waves exceed five feet, uh, or during times of seasonal ice coverage, that if there was a release from the, from the, the pipeline, that remedial efforts efforts to contain that oil spill would be very difficult, if not possible, or if not impossible to implement. And so ELPC and NWF sought to get that rectified. Uh, unfortunately, in February, the, the courts uh, accepted the, the federal court accepted the existing uh, uh, Coast Guard plan for spill response. Uh, the Mackinac Alliance and the Grand Traverse ban of Ottawa and Chippewa India, Indians uh, filed a contested case proceeding before the before Eagle. And uh, that contested case proceeding sought to have the agency really um, look at this, the current efforts to support the now elevated pipeline uh, from a perspective of it being essentially a new pipeline project that should be subject to review under the Public Trust Doctrine and the Great Lakes Submerged Land Act. Unfortunately, the administrative law judge saw differently and uh, uh, did not sustain the arguments being advanced by, by the petitioners in that proceeding. We also had the action filed by, the, uh, by Enbridge uh, that sought to overturn the Attorney General's opinion that Public Act 359 that established the Michigan Strait, uh, Straits Authority was unconstitutional and the state unfortunately lost that action. Uh, we have People of Michigan versus Enbridge. This is the action currently pending before the Ingham Circuit Courts, uh, um, Ingham Court of Claims. Uh, it alleges that the 53 easement sh should be declared void because it was never properly authorized under the Public Trust Doctrine or the Great Lakes Submerged Land Act. It is uh, pending before Judge Jamos, and uh, so is the matter of whether or not a permanent injunction should issue. And then lastly, there's an action uh, by the Bad, Bad River Tribe, and I will yield to, uh, to Brian Newland to talk about that in a few minutes. Next slide, please. So there are, according to Enbridge's account, 18 uh, regulatory approvals or permits or authorizations that are needed for the tunnel. And I wanna talk about one of them in, in particular, and that's the proceeding before the Michigan Public Service Commission. But just to mention that currently pending before EGLE, before the Michigan Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy, are a number of permit applications uh, uh, for, the, for the tunnel. Uh, 
a permit application for to authorize a water discharge for wetland work. The the proposed activity would would uh, fill, I believe, 41 acres of wetlands. Um, there is a stormwater permit that is required and uh, a fourth permit as well. Next slide, please. So uh, just a moment about the lack of financial assurances provided by Enbridge. Under all the agreements, the many agreements that people may be familiar with that were executed under the Snyder administration, the first, second, and third agreement, and the tunnel agreement, uh, none of those signatories on behalf of Enbridge was Enbridge Inc., the Canadian parent company. They were all subsidiaries of Enbridge. In fact, Enbridge has uh, according to expert review, 275 subsidiaries. Uh, and therefore, none of the financial guarantees that flow to the state from these subsidiaries um, or protect coastal, coastal communities or citizens of Michigan or the tribes uh, may actually be sound because the, based upon what was available to be reviewed by our expert, none of the subsidiaries have sufficient financial resources to respond uh, and address a pipeline failure and the consequences of a pipeline failure. And Enbridge Inc. thus far, the Canadian parent, has not agreed to step up to the plate and provide those financial assurances directly. The state of Michigan is not named as a as an additional assured, and uh, and we are concerned, or the state of Michigan is properly concerned, that uh, there is in in fact very little coverage, perhaps no coverage at all, available in the event of a pipeline failure. Enbridge's chief financial officer in a legal proceeding in Wisconsin and, or in Minnesota in 2018 testified that the parent company, Enbridge Inc., would not be res financially responsible for any of the activities uh, of its subsidiaries. So that is concerning. And most recently, in, in the past couple of months, the governor's office and the governor's council has made the demand to Enbridge Inc. to step up to the plate, but they have not as yet. Next slide. So, um, so the tunnel authorization uh, is also before the Michigan Public Service Commission. The Public Service Commission has to make a number of findings and hopefully the review and analysis by the Public Service Commission will be, will be deep and comport with what the law requires. Uh, they need to determine whether or not there's a public need. They need to determine whether the tunnel actually meets safety and engineering standards and it may very well meet safety and engineering standards. Uh, it may in fact be safer than, you know, pipelines suspended across the Straits of Michigan and open to the, to the risk that I just articulated. Um, it may be designed and routed in a reasonable manner, but these findings need to be made they, the, and the design needs to be evaluated. Um, the commission is also required by law to determine if there are environmental impacts or potential environmental impacts from the proposed project and whether those can be appropriately mitigated. Next slide. So they have to determine uh, whether the public benefits outweigh the potential adverse effects and uh, consistent with jurisprudence, federal jurisprudence and state ju jurisprudence across the country for federal approvals and state approvals, the Public uh, Service Commission should determine uh, the amount of downstream carbon emissions that would be added to the atmosphere by the lifetime operation of the pipeline because that is relevant given what we know and our concerns about climate change. And then also, I'm reasonably confident that the that the Public Service Commission will also overlay a analysis under the Michigan Environmental Protection Act, and that's a two-part inquiry. Are there feasible and prudent alternatives to this pipeline? 
then presumably that inquiry should look as as to whether the existing pipeline pipeline network that exists in North America and in the Midwest is adequate to uh, carry the capacity of line five if line five is shut down. And perhaps more importantly, under MEPA, it needs to be determined whether the building of the tunnel is, uh, and its long-term operation is consistent with public health and safety in light of the state's paramount concern for the protection of natural resources. Next slide. Um, but most importantly, the MPSC needs to analyze regulatory risks, pr the prospect that uh, given the urgency of climate change that there will be further restrictions on oil and gas uh, and fossil fuel development, uh, market risk and financial risk. So what we have is a lot of indicators indicating that a 99 year investment in fossil fuel infrastructure may not be economically prudent. We have financial institutions that uh, many now that are of record that are concerned about lending to fo future fossil fuel projects. We have 17 major tar sand projects that have been canceled. We've had two, more than 200 oil and gas development companies file for bankruptcy since 2015. We have ongoing divestments in Albert, Albertan tar sands. Next slide, please. Um, we have the electrification of transportation, and there are various protections by, uh, you know, by banks and, and uh, energy authorities uh, that do deep analyses and prognostications as to what the future will be in terms of reduced oil demand. And, and all of those analyses conclude that there will be less oil demand in the future. We may have already hit peak oil demand uh, presently. We have the world's auto manufacturers, uh, virtually all of them on record that they will aggressively transition their drivetrains to electric drivetrains. We even have many countries now whose parliaments are are poised to bar this future sale of internal combustion engine light duty vehicles. Uh, and in some cases, they are even considering banning at a future date the operation of ICEs, which metropolitan areas around the country are already planning to do. In addition to these factors, we also have a number of insurance companies that have indicated that they will no longer insure pipelines, and many of which who will no longer insure uh, coal mining or coal, coal plant um, operations, including Munich RE, Zurich, Chubb, Access Capital, um, AXA, Aviva, Alliance, and a number of others. So um, that's it. I, I, I just want to sum that the, the most consequential thing that I want people to take away from this presentation is that there are uh, an alarming number of risk factors and the and in the aggregate these risk factors are red flags that should um, uh, I think strongly suggest indeed compel a court to issue a permanent injunction if only we could get the evidence of these risk factors before the court through authoritative experts which were not really positioned to do because we don't have the resources presently to retain those experts. And with that, Liz, I'll end. Thank you, Skip. Uh, it's a perfect segue to our next speaker, Ian Bund, who I'd like to introduce. Uh, he's with Plymouth Gross, Gross uh, he is Plymouth Gross founding partner and senior advisor and has been active in venture capital investing since 1969. He's here in his individual capacity um, to share his wisdom on financial institutions uh, and investments uh, in, in infrastructures like Line 5. Um, he formed the, the first institutional VC in Michigan and has led or co-led 14 funds. He's been involved in building over 350 companies executing over 400 IPOs and serving on the board of more than 20 businesses. 
Ian received an MBA from Harvard University and a Bachelor of Economics from the University of Sydney. He's an Australian chartered accountant. In 2018, he helped produce A Crisis in the Great Lakes, a three-part series documentary film on the dangers of Line 5, which was directed by Barton Bunn, his son. And without further ado, I will turn it over to you, Ian. Thank you and welcome. Thanks, Liz. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, good to be participating. Uh, a couple of preliminary comments. Uh, I first met Liz about six years ago. She was on a panel uh, at the Michigan Theater talking about Line 5, and, and I had the gall to stand up during the Q&A session and suggest that one of the most effective ways to be uh, holding Enbridge to account would be by being a shareholder. Uh, I encourage folks to go out and, and become shareholders uh, and uh, my wife and I uh, are very small shareholders and as shareholders we have certain rights and uh, I've been in communication with Enbridge management for some years now, uh, not that they listen to me, but um, uh, we do have the right to hold them to account. Uh, secondly, um, I, I heard about the Line 5 uh, issue later than, than some of the people on the line here, but I heard about the Line 6B issue uh, about eight or nine years ago. Uh, some employees of the company that we had supported in the Kalamazoo area were, were personally affected by it. And some of those folks uh, uh, lost all equity in their house and uh, will never be able to uh, uh, overcome that. So uh, when uh, a catastrophe like the 6B failure 10 years ago occurs, it, it is of real consequence. Uh, as to my presentation today, um, I refer you to the articles that were included with the um, uh, uh, today's Zoom. You'll be interested that uh, uh, the original title for mine was Should We Risk Our Great Lakes Based Economy? on a house of cards. Some, some learned people modified that title uh, in consultation with me to Enbridge on the Brink. And it ended up with this uh, uh, rather uh, modest uh, title. But um, if you look at uh, Enbridge, uh, you will see the following. It's a very complicated company, 250 companies and partnerships. Um, and it, that's being done to contain their risks uh, so that if an activity fails, the parent company can walk without having to bail out the activity. It may have some fines and costs to pay, uh, but it sees that as just simply uh, part of the cost of doing business. So uh, when, when you look at the last uh, 15 to 18 months, when Enbridge has had at least 10 major line ruptures and failures, uh, typically what they've done is shut the line, pay their fines, move on. Uh, it's a well-known fact in the pipeline business that lines are run until failure. Uh, that's the industry norm, and Enbridge is the biggest in the industry and the baddest. Their total focus is on today's cash flow. Uh, Skip just covered the insurance situation. In fact, uh, Enbridge is largely self-insured. They did have insurance 
going into the uh, line 6B failure, but exhausted most of it and are still arguing with their insurance carriers on that. Uh, the, re the recent request by the state of Michigan to cover the event of failure uh, has been uh, really met with vague unsupported promises. Uh, but the study that led to that, that uh, Skip referred to is, is very astute and worth looking at. Um, <clears throat> When, when, when you take a look at any information coming out of Enbridge, uh, including a press release a few days ago, it, it usually has very little to do with, with uh, the facts. Uh, when you look at their financial reporting, which I follow closely, you see them uh, emphasizing their distributable cash flow. Uh, but in reality, uh, they are spending the bulk of their cash flow on paying out dividends, which I think over time is going to become kind of an empty promise to financial markets because it's not sustainable. Uh, if you look at their latest quarterly report uh, where they uh, claimed that they had 2.1 billion of positive cash flow. Uh, in fact, the company was supported by borrowing another 6.9 billion, taking their aggregate uh, balance sheet borrowings to close to $80 billion. Uh, missing from their accounting is the reserves to cover self-insurance. So they've made these promises to all sorts of regulatory authorities all over the country and in Canada, none of those are supported by proper assurances or insurance. Uh, they have a huge deferred maintenance that is not reserved. And then when they merged with Spectrum about three years ago, quite a large operator in itself, uh, they brought to the table another grouping of obsolete properties and pipelines whose value, in my view, is grossly impaired. Their financial statements do not recognize any impairment. Uh, so I, I think the big issue with Enbridge is one, their stocks yielding 7.6%, which is a yield almost three times uh, comparable uh, size companies. The, the real thing with Enbridge is there's just no trust that the market does not trust them, investors do not trust them, regulators do not, tribal leaders do not. And from an investor point of view, you, you're looking at uh, the payment of dividends at a rate that are not supported by earnings and are only supported by uh, uh, taking on additional debt. So in, in my view, uh, the red herring called the tunnel here in the Straits is, is simply another ploy by Enbridge to buy time to earn its daily cash flow from line five. That cash flow is prodigious if you relate it to its uh, 2019 results. It is about 9% of the company's total cash flow. And if you look at it from a net, net cash flow, it's about 8%. So they're doing everything possible to put band-aids on this obsolete pipeline 
in order to protect that cash flow. Uh, thanks for your time, and I look forward to your uh, uh, questions. Thank you so much, Ian. I'm so glad we, we met six years ago at that time, and, uh, and now look at the partnerships and collaborations we have. Speaking of other very important partnerships, uh, it is with the tribes who uh, have the five federally rec recognized tribes uh, hold sovereign treaty rights in these waters. And we're going to hear from uh, uh, Chairman Brian Newland, who is the elected uh, chairman of the Bay Mills Indian Community. And uh, they're one of the 12 sovereign tribal nations located in Michigan. Prior to serving in this capacity, Brian was an attorney in private practice representing Indian tribes across the United States on various issues. From 2009 to 2012, he served as a policy advisor to the Assistant Secretary of the Interior for Indian Affairs in President Obama's administration. Brian, I'm going to turn the mic over to you now. Sure, miigwech. Thanks for having me, Liz, and, and thanks to all of you for uh, joining us today um, on this uh, to discuss this important topic. Um, Liz mentioned that there are 12 federally recognized tribes here in the state of Michigan, um, and uh, it, it often comes as a surprise to people that uh, every square inch of this great state was at one point um, owned and governed by sovereign tribal nations. Um, and uh, when we get to issues like uh, the Line 5 pipeline, for example, a lot of times uh, skeptics uh, and policymakers uh, look at tribes as though we are some sort of front uh, group for other interests uh, and that we don't have important interests of our own. Uh, so I want to walk you through uh, briefly why that isn't the case for us here uh, with respect to the Enbridge uh, Line 5 pipeline. Um, and then I want to uh, pull back the lens and talk generally about the permitting process for this tunnel project. But, um, you know, generally speaking, uh, Bay Mills Indian Community is one of more than 30 bands of Ojibwe tribes in the United States. And uh, we have a cultural interest in the waters of the Great Lakes in general, but also the Straits of Mackinac in particular. Uh, so many of you are no doubt familiar with the story in the Bible of uh, the great flood and Noah and Mount Sinai. Well, in our history and our cultural teachings, we have a similar story as well of a flood that covered the earth. And then when the earth was remade, it was remade upon the back of a turtle that came out of, uh, out of the flood waters and that's where the earth was reborn and, and our culture was renewed. And our teachings tell us that uh, that great turtle uh, arose from the water actually where Mackinac Island is. Uh, and, and the Ojibwe word for turtle is Mikinuk, uh, which may sound familiar to some of you. And so the waters and the lands around the Straits of Mackinac uh, are sacred to us. Um, as sacred as Mount Sinai is uh, for people who uh, worship uh, and practice religious beliefs found in the Bible. And so we are talking about a pipeline that jeopardizes uh, the literal birthplace or rebirth place of our planet. Um, and so uh, our tribes have a cultural interest in protecting uh, the Straits of Mackinac and the, the spiritual integrity of the waters and lands in the area. In addition, we have a number of uh, ceremonial sites and burial sites in and around the Straits area uh, that could potentially be damaged by a tunnel project. So on top of our cultural interests, uh, the tribes also have a legal interest. If we can go back to the first slide, I'll talk about that. Um, so you see there, this is a map of all of the treaty sessions uh, that tribes made uh, of lands in the state of Michigan to the United States. Uh, in 1836, uh, that yellow area that comprises the top half of the lower peninsula and the eastern half of the upper peninsula, uh, the five uh, Ojibwe and Odawa bands uh, in, the, in northern Michigan uh, 
uh, signed a treaty with the United States. The state of Michigan did not exist in 1836. And through that treaty, we ceded all of that yellow territory that you're seeing on your screens to the United States. Uh, and that treaty and that land session actually allowed the state of Michigan to be admitted to the Union as uh, one of the United States just a year later in 1837. But in exchange for uh, giving up all that land, all of our homelands, uh, we kept a few things for ourselves. And one of the things that we kept is the right to hunt, fish, and gather throughout the waters and lands uh, that we ceded um, as we had uh, been accustomed to doing. And that right has been upheld in various federal court decisions um, and is actually the subject of a, a famous case called the United States versus Michigan. Uh, that case has to deal with tribal treaty fishing rights in the Great Lakes in, uh, in the boundaries of that ceded territory. And that right has been upheld. And we actually co-manage the Great Lakes fishery with the state of Michigan and the federal government in those waters. So now we know that the tribes have a cultural interest in protecting the Straits of Mackinac. We have a legal interest in these waters. We also have an economic interest in protecting the Straits of Mackinac in these waters. Um, here at Bay Mills and at the Sault Ste. Marie tribe, our tribal economies are heavily dependent on tribal commercial fishing. And like everywhere else in Northern Michigan, we're also heavily dependent on tourism to Northern Michigan uh, to support our local businesses. Um, so anything that's going to jeopardize commercial fishing in these waters, as well as our tourism economy, is going to jeopardize our very existence. So you got a little bit of background on why do tribes really care about this issue? Are you just a front for other radical Antifa type groups, right, that they throw everything against the wall uh, and see what sticks? And we have legitimate legal, cultural, and economic interests uh, to the lands and waters around the Straits of Mackinac. So that's the that's the jumping off point for why tribes like Bay Mills Indian Community have become engaged in the permitting and legal process uh, that the previous speakers have, have addressed before. Now, one of the things um, that we have in this country is, with respect to environmental protection is the Federal Environmental Protection Act. And Ever since that law was passed, uh, these companies like Enbridge have, have tried to do what's called segment their projects. Because if you have a big enough project um, that is going to jeopardize the, the public health or jeopardize the environment, uh, if you can cut it up into smaller pieces, uh, and you can sometimes get away with having each one of those small pieces evade uh, significant governmental review for environmental impacts. And so over the years, we've seen with Enbridge now, they file these applications for one screw anchor permit, a couple others here, you know, let's dredge under the pipeline there. Um, and uh, what they've really been able to do is redesign and re-engineer the Straits Crossing out of the public eye and without any meaningful environmental review from federal or state agencies, because they've cut it up into tiny pieces. Now, this tunnel project is itself a uh, segmentation because its intent is to keep the entire Line 5 pipeline in operation from end to end. The Line 5 pipeline, as many of you may know, spans 645 miles from Superior, Wisconsin to Sarnia, Ontario, using the state of Michigan as a shortcut, and it crosses through three Great Lakes watersheds. Um, and this tunnel, will all but ensure that the entire pipeline stays in operation. And there are other problems along the length of this pipeline uh, that were alluded to in prior uh, presentations uh, that also jeopardize the long-term operation of this pipeline. Uh, for example, uh, the Bad River Indian Reservation in Northern Wisconsin actually has line five cut across the reservation and Enbridge uh, had a right of way to operate the pipeline through the reservation, and that right of way has expired. They are presently operating the Line 5 pipeline across uh, the Bad River Indian Reservation in trespass. So they have no legal right to continue to operate, but they're doing it anyway. And uh, 
if they can piece enough of these permits together, they can ensure that the Line 5 pipeline as a whole stays in operation. Um, so the other part, uh, so we've been engaged in this process in, in, in different stages. Um, the other part that is going on now, we, we talked about the EGLE permitting process. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is involved here as well. And Skip men mentioned um, in his presentation or his discussion that the MPSC is going to evaluate the structural uh, integrity and safe operation of the Line 5 pipeline. When our tribe first engaged with the MPSC in tribal consultation, we put the question to them very bluntly. Has the MPSC ever denied a permit for an oil pipeline? And the answer was no. Uh, and we asked about the process they used to evaluate uh, the structural integrity of the pipeline itself. And uh, they said it is not really their job to determine whether the pipeline is designed safely, that, that they're really going to rely on Enbridge itself. And we asked the same question of the Army Corps of Engineers. We said, you guys, you're, you're, the name of your agency is literally the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, are you going to evaluate the structural design of Enbridge's proposed tunnel? And are you going to assess whether this pipeline can safely operate in that configuration? And the answer was, that's not our job. We do not evaluate the safety of the Line 5 pipeline. Uh, we're going to defer to Enbridge. So if you pull back and you look as a whole, you know, we're segmenting all this permitting process up into little pieces. It becomes apparent that there is no regulatory agency at the federal or state level that looks at the Line 5 pipeline, whether it's suspended above the lake bed as it is now or put inside a tunnel, there's no agency that says that is safe. And so really what we have is uh, Enbridge telling us we can do this, it's safe, take our word for it, and nobody to verify that process. Um, if you all remember the Deepwater Horizon oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico, that was a wake up call for a lot of us because we looked at that, we said, there's all these oil rigs in the Gulf of Mexico uh, and they are drilling for oil in waters that are two and three miles deep, uh, there's got to be some kind of safety plan. There's got to be a contingency plan for when things go wrong. This must be safe. And uh, we were all shocked to learn that that is not the case. And the same is true with respect to the Line 5 pipeline and the proposed tunnel here in the streets. There's nobody at the wheel. There's nobody watching to make sure this is safe. And we are all being expected to take Enbridge's word for it. Uh, the last thing I wanted to hit on uh, before we turn it over to you for question and answer uh, is, again, going back to Skip's um, presentation, he gave an overview of litigation. Um, two things. First, Bay Mills Indian Community has proposed to intervene in the Michigan Public Service Commission uh, review of Enbridge's permit, and we're awaiting a ruling on that. Uh, but there's another lawsuit that has uh, been going on for several years out of the public's eye uh, that directly affects the Line 5 pipeline, and that is a case called the United States versus Enbridge. Uh, the EPA sued Enbridge in 2016 for all kinds of safety violations along with what's called the Lakehead system. The Lakehead system is all of Enbridge's pipelines that it operates in the upper Great Lakes, including the Line 5 pipeline. And that lawsuit was filed uh, mostly to uh, address the Kalamazoo River oil spill and other oil spills in uh, Illinois. Uh, but tucked away, uh, or so they, they filed that lawsuit, the EPA did, and they settled it with Enbridge the same day. And tucked away in that settlement agreement uh, was a passage saying that Enbridge had to maintain safe operations of the Line 5's uh, pipelines uh, Straits Crossing. And in the last four years, Enbridge and the EPA have modified that settlement agreement a number of times. That's where the screw anchor uh, supports uh, come from. Uh, those were required by the EPA in the settlement agreement. And these negotiations, because it's litigation and because they are settlement discussions, they occur out of the public eye. They're not, a, uh, they're not a regulatory permitting process. Uh, 
Um, they're not put out for uh, public hearing and public notice and comment. This is government lawyers and Enbridge lawyers sitting down together to work out changes to the settlement agreement. And a lot of these proposals that Enbridge has come out with in recent years flow directly out of that lawsuit and the settlement agreements. And uh, a lot of uh, what is going on with the Line 5 pipeline is being negotiated behind closed doors as part of that lawsuit and these friendly settlement agreements that Enbridge has been able to negotiate with the EPA. Um, so with that, I'll stop. Uh, and I appreciate you, Liz, uh, for organizing. You and the folks at Flow have been great allies. Appreciate the work you guys are doing. Appreciate you inviting me on to uh, give a little bit of uh, perspective on why Michigan's tribes care so much about this issue. And I look forward to answering questions. Miigwech. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, all of our presenters. Um, th at this point, I, you know, if we weren't virtual, I'd, we'd have like this round of applause. So I'm, you know, putting my emoji of the hand out there. Uh, and I know all of our, our uh, listeners are thinking the same. There's um, a lot, a lot of fantastic questions um, that I want to dive right into. Um, Two, two just quick kind of issues. You know, we have um, in this story, we've got the ongoing uh, continued operations of uh, this pipeline that is pumping 23 million gallons a day, although right now we're at half capacity because of the court order shutdown in, in June because of Judge Jamo. Um, you know, we, we didn't talk a lot about it, but you know, the, the, the studies we uh, and, and many other groups have examined is, you know, we're only seeing about five to 10% of that oil actually benefiting Michigan. Um, and the, the other issues that have, have really been elevated um, by Enbridge is if this pipeline is shut down, the world will end up in the um, Upper Peninsula uh, we had a, a wonderful webinar two weeks ago. Uh, Patty Peake, who's chairman of the Straits of Mackinac Alliance, um, uh, she likes to always tell me that you know she's one of those grannies. And she said that they would not freeze. Um, so uh, one of one of the questions I'd like to um, put out there is to talk about the alternatives. If this pipeline is shut down, um, you know, Brian, maybe you want to. Uh, start with that and others can lead uh, and and we will answer many questions as many as we can. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Liz. Uh, you know, the it, to go back to the question, what happens to the UP? Uh, the UP Energy Task Force has identified that uh, only 20% of the homes up here rely on propane uh, for their primary heating source. And by the way, the propane is offloaded from line five, 100 miles west of the streets. Uh, I'm coming to you from my house, uh, which uh, 11 months out of the year is heated by natural gas uh, that does not come from Enbridge line five pipeline. And I can assure you that those of us who live in the UP will not be burning our books and our furniture to keep warm all winter long if the pipeline is shut down. Uh, with respect to alternatives, um, Enbridge owns the Lakehead pipeline system, which I referenced before that has uh, oil pipelines all across the upper Great Lakes that take Canadian tar sands oil to market. And if you saw a map of, of these pipelines, uh, there's only one that cuts across the state of Michigan, cuts through the watersheds of three separate Great Lakes and, and actually passes beneath uh, the Great Lakes themselves. And that's the Line 5 pipeline. And so if this pipeline were shut down today, as it was a month ago, life would go on for everybody watching. Uh, you would barely notice, uh, if you noticed at all, any disruption in your daily lives, and the oil would continue to get to market until we were able to build a carbon-free uh, energy economy here in this country. Great. Uh, do others, Skip, would you like to say anything? Or Ian, did you have? Uh, I think the only thing that I add is that uh, 
in the pipeline business, uh, the, the uh, general admonition of uh, the tribes is you need to look out seven generations. You tend to see that happening in the pipeline business, and uh, they're very interested in redundancy. Uh, and, and in their case, uh, line five is, is largely there for being able to participate in Enbridge's strategy of ex. So Liz, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, Skip. Quick, quick, quickly, uh, three points. One, uh, uh, the Energy Information Administration in December 2019 released an inventory of, of pipelines uh, under construction or expansions under constructions or new proposed pipelines that have been permitted since 2010 through 2019. That number was 230 and 21 of those were Enbridge um, expansions or new pi pipelines. Um, but well, more importantly, recently, there have been multiple reports of em uh, Enbridge having excess capacity because of the lower production uh, in Alberta, of the tar, uh, tar sands, uh, such low capacity that they've even used part of their pipeline capacity to store orange, uh, oil when there was a storage uh, crunch. And then finally, with regard to workarounds, um, let me say parenthetically that this requires, the answer to the question really requires analysis of the pipeline network in North America, the capacity to share pipelines, yada, yada. Uh, but when line 6B happened, when we had that catastrophic event and that line, major capacity line was shut down for an extended period of time, people did not go without oil. They they found the work right. There would be a new if equilibrium within the system was established and we got by. Great, thank you, Skip. And, and um, if I may add, after the Line 6B disaster, we just, we just hit the 10 year anniversary on July 25th of uh, one of the largest inland oil spills in US history uh, in the aftermath of the BP Horizon spill. Um, Enbridge was then able to double its capacity and rebuild line 6B um, through Lower Michigan as well. Um, just to um, add to your point about you know, segmenting and increasing capacity throughout the pipeline. Um, let's see, boy, there are so many questions here. Um, one for Ed, uh, Dr. Ed Tim. Um, uh, 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 Barbara Samarisis wants to know a little bit more about the current induced stress uh, on the pipelines and um, specifically the potential impacts of the 2020 record high water levels uh, in the straits on the current operations of the pipeline. Uh, thank you. And it, it, that's a very interesting question. Uh, actually, I was uh, asked that question at some recent point in the past about the high water levels. And I talked uh, to Eric Anderson, the uh, gentleman at Great Lakes Environmental Lab that's done all the computer modeling. And uh, really, it doesn't appear that the increased water uh, depth, which is really a, not a great percentage increase in the water depth, uh, has much effect on the flow velocities uh, in the straits. But that begs the question, that we don't know what those flow velocities are. Uh, and that's a fundamental input into any structural analysis of this thing. There have been very few me measurements made of those velocities. There are bones to pick with all the measurements. And the buoy that Enbridge has in the straits that appears to measure currents also appears to be producing garbage data. Imagine that. So, I, 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 you know, it, it's a very, realistic thing to be concerned about. And for years, I've recommended to the state of Michigan that we need to get some real solid data on the straits. It isn't a difficult task. It's, it's conventional technology that would be used. It isn't very expensive even. A couple hundred thousand dollars would fund a one-year study. To date, that has not been done. So 
all of the engineering analyses of this structure, the single most important input variable is not quantified. And so that gives me huge concern as far as trying to worry about what failure modes may be actively in this structure. And, and by elevating the structure or really supporting it over a reduced bottom height, they've induced several failure modes having to do with current induced effects on the pipelines. It's, it's, it's the fundamental area I'm concerned about with this thing. Right. So just, you know, as a visual um, for our audience, you can imagine, you know, um, we have almost 200 of these anchor, these screw anchors elevating the pipeline off the lake bed floor with these saddles. And then, you know, to Skip's point, increasing the risk for anchor strikes. We've had three in the last 18 months. Um, so Dr. Tim, are you saying though, would, could there be an easy kind of technological analysis of looking at the currents at the lake bed floor that the state should invest or, or demand that Enbridge invest in? Ab absolutely. This is a subject really. Roger Gauthier, who is a hydrologist and has worked with the Army Corps for 30 years, measuring and modeling currents and I are in complete accordance. We tried to propose a consortium to uh, uh, put the, uh, these measurements together, hire an appropriate contractor to put in the devices uh, called analog Doppler current profilers. They'd have to be bottom mounted because there's virtually no data about what happens in the winter. All the ones that we've seen have by and large been buoy mounted and so they're pulled out in the worst part of the year. We have almost no data for November through the peak of the storm season in the spring. Uh, that proposal, which was put forward with Enbridge, obviously uh, got a pretty cold reception. And so we're still at a loss to get the most single important bit of data to decide if this pipeline's safe. Great, thank you. It's the Achilles heel of the current operations, as I like to say it. <laughs> um, we have a question from George Goodman, and he is asking, um, how can Enbridge continue using Line 5 without taking financial resp responsibility for any damage? Uh, you know, based on all known risk factors, can the state legally require Line 5 to be shut down until all the required reviews are completed? And I think, you know, Skip and Ian, you both probably can weigh in there. Well, that that is a core issue. Um, it, it, uh, some might argue that it is unconscionable to continue to operate the pipeline without bona fide financial assurances in place that would um, protect coastal communities, the tribes in the state of Michigan in the event of a failure. Um, they're not there. Uh, there is the suggestion by the expert, uh, and we had the most renowned expert on pipeline insurance matters uh, uh, that, were, that was retained by the state. And he recommended that the state require an, at least an increment of the insurance to be environmental uh, impairment liability insurance. Uh, there isn't a lot of it available globally in the market, but he felt it would be a test to determine whether or not line five is insurable at all. And he has concerns that it in fact may not be given all the risk factors that have been identified. Yeah. I, I'd like to just mention one point there. It's, yes. it's my belief that the pipeline is not insurable. The primary insurers of pipelines is the uh, Danish company DNV and DNV has written the standards for pipelines that have to be remediated like this and line five isn't close to meeting those standards. So I don't know who would jump in and try and insure something where you can't evaluate the risk. Highly unlikely to happen at any price. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Ian, I, I want to um, talk a little bit about um, the, the tunnel, right? So this is a proposed solution that Enbridge actually has, uh, you know, connected through a third agreement in 2018 with the Snyder administration, coupled with Act 359, which is this uh, tunnel agreement. 
um, and uh, a 99 year easement and assignment from the Department of Natural Resources to the Michigan, uh, excuse me, to the Mackinac Straits Corridor Authority and then to Enbridge. Um, to your points, uh, your, your uh, you know, the, the many points that you've articulated about uh, insurance and, and Enbridge really being a house of cards, um, do you think, you know, as you said, it's a, a red herring, do you think the tunnel will actually ever, ever be built? <clears throat> well, I, I think, it, first of all, we all need to be clear that the risks of Line 5 as it's currently operating are unsustainable, and that needs to be a self-standing issue. As to the separate issue of the tunnel as a possible solution, uh, such tunnels can be built. I mean, uh, one of the first projects I worked on after graduate school was the English Channel Tunnel. Uh, many, many attempts were made to, uh, to do that over at least 150 years. And the group that, that uh, built it and now operate it, it's been reasonably successful. Um, the, uh, I'm also familiar with the extensive tunnel systems under Sydney Harbor, which have been quite successful. To, to, to do something like this as a dedicated I think we've lost Ian. To, to do something like this as a dedicated oil tunnel uh, that in its latest design is approximately twice the size that was envisaged uh, when the original Snyder negotiations were undertaken. Um, I, I really wonder about the feasibility of this uh, and I, I, uh, I wonder about the financeability of this. Liz, you described the, the conduit that would be used for financing. Well, that's going to have to be bonded. Uh, council are going to have to give permit, uh, opinions on the bondability of that. Uh, insurance companies are going to have to step up to it. And those insurance companies will... Well, these are the challenges of our virtual meetings, but we will carry on and bring Ian back on when we hear him. Um, another comment from uh, Sarah Chatterley via Facebook. Um, she's, she asserts we need more transparency on updates for, about the condition of the infrastructure to the public and um, is interested to know more about how we can hold private industry accountable. Brian, maybe you could speak a little bit more to this uh, particularly given um, the imperative um, uh, relationship uh, and, and, uh, uh, between sovereign nations and the U.S. government with tribal consultations. Uh, well, thanks, Liz. To, to answer the question about how do we hold private industry accountable, um, you know, that, that's, that's one thing. Uh, but what I have learned, so when I when I started getting involved in in this particular issue, I had a my assumption was there is some agency in some government branch of government somewhere that is in charge of oversight here, and uh, the frustrating part uh, that that I have come to learn is there simply isn't. Uh, there are many federal and state agencies that have regulatory oversight over just a little piece of it. And so there's, that breeds a lack of transparency because there's no one agency that can give you all of the information that's relevant to this, um, uh, re relevant to this pipeline. So uh, 
It was a federal agency called FIMSA, the Pipeline Hazardous Materials Safety Administration. And you will ask them about the condition of the Line 5 pipeline. And they say, well, I can't tell you that. We only know uh, what liquids are going on the inside of that. And then you ask uh, the Army Corps about the condition of the pipeline. They say, we can't tell you that. We only look at where it touches the lake bed. And then you ask the, the Coast Guard about uh, Enbridge's safety plans. And they say, we only get involved after there's an oil spill. Uh, and uh, you ask Eagle about this and they say, well, we only have a very narrow scope of responsibility. And oftentimes those agencies will share with you uh, what they know, but there is no one agency that uh, at any level of government that says, uh, here's what's going on with the pipeline. Uh, so then the question really falls back on, uh, you know, the governor herself uh, with respect to all the state agencies and at the federal level, uh, the president and whether their administrations are committed to getting all of that information out. Um, thankfully, I, I will say Governor Whitmer's administration has uh, been forthcoming with a lot of the information that they have uh, on this pipeline, but it's been very difficult because this thing gets diffused across the board. And so nobody has all the pieces. Thank you. Well, we are rapidly coming to a close. Um, and I, I want to let everybody know that we're going to, again, send everybody a follow-up email with a recording, um, links to the, the recording of this webinar, the slides, and related resources. Uh, and Emma, if we could um, go to the slides now, um, I, I'd like to uh, really urge our listeners uh, to put the legal and the sci scientific and financial facts that our incredible panelists have brought to bear today um, to, you know, to take action, to stay engaged. And as, as all of our panelists have alluded to, this is a, a complex arena that involves both state and federal actors. What makes Lion 5 unique is its location in public trust waters, in sovereign treaty lands and waters. And, um, and that sovereign title uh, is being juxtaposed uh, and, and needs to um, be protected. The paramount interests of the public trust uh, must prevail over any private interests. Um, so uh, just a couple of quick uh, things to point out. We, tomorrow night, Eagle is going to have a webinar to, to, to talk and help navigate the public through this permitting and comment period because it's very complex. This is related uh, to the multiple uh, permits that have impacts on wetlands. Uh, there's a there's a NPDES permit that um, uh, there's a request for over five million gallons per day that would be discharged into the Great Lakes uh, with the construction of this this uh, tunnel. Um, very significant socioeconomic impacts uh, with the construction of a pipeline that would take you know close to three years. Major traf traffic uh, and and closures um, uh, and you know. Uh, impact to uh, local tourism. Um, let us go to the next slide, Emma, please. We also have the MPSC hearing. This involves the, the uh, pipeline siting of, of, the, of the proposed uh, Line 5 underneath the straits. Uh, there are, as Brian alluded to, there are um, Bay Mills and, and other tribes and um, many other groups uh, have are petitioning to intervene, and there will be a public hearing on August 24th. Uh, and this is the forum, of course, that that Skip also talked about, where uh, the focus will be on the public need and feasible and prudent alternatives that we had a chance to talk about a little bit. Okay, next slide, please. Um, the Army Corps is involved. Uh, the Army Corps and Eagle actually are, are uh, they have joint jurisdiction um, 
uh, for the, the Great Lakes. And so um, stay tuned for whether or not they will be having a hearing. Um, uh, many of our groups have submitted adverse impacts uh, related to the, the tunnel construction. Next, please. Um, and I also just want to point out, um, we didn't get a, a much chance to talk about the uh, potential economic and, and oil spill recovery, but uh, Dr. David Schwab was really instrumental in uh, his studies back in 2014 and 2016 to identify over 720 miles of um, potential, uh, of, excuse me, 720 miles where this, an oil spill could affect uh, the Great Lakes. Um, so um, I just want to conclude and, and um, again, thank our incredible panelists for their wonderful contributions. Um, one thing we can all agree on is that the Great Lakes are no place for, uh, for oil pipelines. And this is our moment to create a lasting legacy for the Great Lakes and its people. We need immense public pressure to finally decommission Line 5. And to that end, we are urging you to contact Governor Whitmer to revoke the 1953 easement, join and join the Attorney General's lawsuit. Um, our panelists have shared incredible knowledge on scientific, legal, and financial uh, factors. And um, I want to finally thank the Mackinac Island Community Foundation for supporting this webinar today. And um, we're very thankful to all of you for attending and taking action to protect the Great Lakes. Thank you and have a wonderful, wonderful afternoon.